sizes. It attacks persons of all ages, spreading by the means of the uncontrolled growth of cells. Dr. Now, Ketchum was here at Montgomery to talk about breast yes. cancer and the research Marijuana. he and other doctors are involved in to help alleviate its growth. Although there are not many new developments, Dr. Ketchum says there is now hope for women who were failures in cancer research. Surgery and radiation are the chief methods of treatment. However, chemotherapy is an important means of relieving the symptoms of cancer when surgery and radiation cannot help. We've got some new approaches which allows this lady to live many, many years in, under many circumstances after her cancer has failed in its treatment. So from that standpoint, yes, it's very exciting. From the standpoint of primary treatment for a cure, we really don't have anything great. But I must mention that there is a trend at a national level towards doing somewhat less radical surgery for the early cancer. And I think the new thing for us to be aware of is that we treat each, treat each cancer as an individual cancer. No one operation is best for all cancers of the breast. Some of them might be treated by some of the small ones by a small operation with uh, other types of treatment being added. Uh, I'm excited about the future, but at the present time, I think the lady who's coming into her doctor and demanding that she have her breast left completely intact in spite of the fact she has a proven diagnosis of cancer is not offering herself the best opportunity of cure. You know, breast cancer is always kind of a startling thing. Is there any way that the, the doctor or the patient could realize that a woman is going to get breast cancer? Are there any contributing factors? Well, you know, there's a few cancers that we know the cause of. We don't pay much attention to it, but we know the cause of. We'll talk about that in a moment if you'll give us the time. But, but breast cancer, we don't know what causes it. And we're just overly alarmed at our ignorance about the cause. But we do know something, and that is that the survival from the treatment of breast cancer is directly related to the size of the cancer when it's treated. So in answer to your question, yes, self-breast examination. Now the lady says to me, Dr. Ketchum, I can't examine my breast. It's sort of lumpy and bumpy, and I get all alarmed, and I really don't know what I'm feeling. That's because she does it once a month and then usually forgets it every other month. If she would do it once a week, every Sunday morning, just take a few moments and examine her breast, sitting up with her hand over, stretching it. If she breasts are large enough, like she was running her hand over a balloon with water in it, lying down for a minute with her hand over her head and examining it, I realize she won't really know what she's feeling for several weeks, maybe several months. But I can assure you that if she'll do that energetically, that when that lump comes, that pea or that marble-like mass, she will say, something feels different. Do you realize in some areas of the country where we have really successfully indoctrinated people into self-breast examination, seven out of 10 of the breast cancers that are requiring treatment are brought to our attention by the patient. It can be done. So the lady that says self-breast examination, I can't do it, I get all nervous. Well, she better look at the fact that breast cancer is presently the number one killer in women between the ages of 35 and 55. And it need not be if they would come in early and stop that pessimistic philosophy of saying to me when I say, Mrs. Jones, where have you been? Your breast cancer is, your breast lump is as big as a walnut. You must have known it was there. You know what she says? Doctor, I was afraid it was cancer. We've got to get rid of that pessimistic philosophy because breast cancer can be cured. You just gotta come in early. The seven danger signals of cancer are unusual bleeding or discharge, a lump or thickening in the breast or elsewhere, a sore that does not heal, a change in normal bowel or bladder habits, continuous hoarseness or cough, persistent indigestion or difficulty in swallowing, or a change in a wart or mold. This is Janet May reporting for Alabama Illustrated. Well, based on uh, revenue projections for the, uh, the rest of the fiscal year, the governor has instructed uh, all departments who receive funds from the Special Education Trust Fund to cut back effective March 1st by 6% of all expenditures. What outward effect will this have? Well, the, um, the main effect will, will be that they will have to start some immediate uh, cost-cutting and austerity measures. Uh, the, uh, 
the way the letters and the correspondence reads to the uh, departments affected, it will uh, be up to the department head to decide what measures they wish to take. And I think most of them heeded this, Ms. Wilson. What about support personnel? Well, no salaries would be a problem. I'd like to point out that we've been, been anticipating this since the legislature closed last summer. First week in October, I called all the superintendents of education in Montgomery and advised them that I anticipated some 5% proration this year and advised them to take all necessary action to curtail their expenses in the local school systems. That would, would mean that they'd have 5% proration. We told our two-year college presidents who are under the State Board of Education to submit to us a budget with a 5% proration figure, which they did. The State Department of Education directors and assistant superintendents were notified at that time to anticipate a 5% proration. So having done this as early as we did, we feel that the schools will be able to cope with this matter better than they have in past years. So as of today, we are anticipating some $55 million short of what the legislature had appropriated for education in the state this year. Most of the members of the Sunset Committee wanted to abolish the Board of Corrections. Committee Chairman Representative Walter Owens pointed out the problems they could have if they do recommend the termination of the Board. And I have done some research pertaining to it, and I have the 1953 law which repealed the 1939 law which set up the Board of Corrections under the control of the Governor and a Director. <clears throat> 1939 law was in existence for 14 years, I believe it was, and it did have a director answerable to the governor. But in 1953, the wisdom of the legislature was that uh, it be changed. And in reviewing this <clears throat> act, Act Number 202, it's 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 my opinion and the opinion of a number of others that have reviewed it that uh, the Board of Corrections do have total control of all aspects of the Board of Corrections. So if we recommend the legislature that this board be terminating, we would also be recommending that the department be terminated. So for that reason, I think we should carry this over uh, for us to get a little more insight as to what this motion would have, the impact of this motion. Instead of voting to abolish the board, the committee postponed its decision until a later date when the legal implications of such a move could be determined. The committee will have to meet and decide before the 10th legislative day of the regular session. On that day, the committee will have to make known to the legislature its recommendations. One board did not get away as easily. The committee recommended abolition of the Military Advisory Board because it has never functioned. Dennis Latham, WSFA TV News at the Capitol. Not very many people remembered that today is Alabama State University's 79th birthday. Although classes were suspended for the program, students apparently found something better to do for those three hours. During the past two years, Alabama State has had its share of controversy and is still under federal court order to end discrimination practices. Today, an alumnus of the school, Dr. Marlon Brown, talked to the audience on destroying myths. Why have you seen color blue? Have you seen it invent anything? Have you seen it hit a ball? Have you seen it fix a chair? Have you seen it create anything? You haven't seen color do anything. It's the individual that's doing it. And this is where the leadership is coming from, from you. Those that can think this way and forget about color. Janet May, WSFA TV News. 
Auburn got off to a good start. Here Bubba Price makes a driving layup that put Auburn ahead by four points with about ten minutes to play in the first half. However, Tennessee began a scoring attack two minutes before the intermission that concluded with this basket to give the Vols a 31 to 24 halftime lead. With 16 and a half minutes to go in the game, Rich Valvicious hits this shot to cut the Tennessee lead to two points, 32 to 30. Then the Volunteers took control, mainly on free throws. Tennessee capitalized on 25 Auburn fouls, including this one on Earl Banks, his fourth. Reggie Johnson hit the free throws to give Tennessee a 10 point lead, 46 to 36, with nine minutes to go. Johnson finished the game with 31 points. Here he makes a slam dunk that brought the Knoxville crowd to its feet. The Tigers hit several outside shots in the second half, but they just couldn't close the gap. Auburn coach Sonny Smith called the contest the worst for Auburn this season, saying the offense had poor execution. Auburn fell to 3-9 in the SEC with the loss, while Tennessee picked up its seventh win in the conference against six losses. James Spann, WSFA-TV Sports. Defense attorney Ray Acton, representing former Coosa County Sheriff Veston Peters, called more witnesses to the stand in his efforts to prove that voter fraud was the reason that his client lost the 1978 sheriff's race in Coosa County to the defendant, Bill Evans. Acton called numerous Coosa County residents who he contends were led into voting for Evans either through compromise or ignorance. One witness who took the stand, Mrs. Lori Geddes, testified that she was offered a deal by the Coosa County probate judge, Jasper Fieldings, of a reduced fine on a number of state trooper citations if she voted for Evans. That testimony was corroborated by Mrs. Geddes' sister-in-law, who also was cited by the state troopers and claims a similar deal offered to her by Fieldings. Fieldings, also a defendant in the case, took the stand and testified that he had never made deals for votes or had even offered money for votes or had even supported or campaigned for Evans in any way. Through another witness, Acton established that Fieldings and Peters did not get along and had on one occasion had a verbal confrontation in public. Acton is responsible for showing that enough voter fraud occurred to change the outcome of that 1978 race, and Peters is contending that the use of absentee ballots was the method through which voter fraud brought about a change in the race. At the federal courthouse, Chris Grimshaw, WSFA TV News. If you will make a decision now that in your young life you will never, even be a partaker, even abstain her completely of alcoholic beverages and those, of course, drugs which will drag you down and exactly will drug you along exactly what it will do. You remember that. That today is eating at the vitals of the security of these United States. And it's being brought in by the billions of dollars, millions and millions of dollars worth to corrupt the youth of this land. And I hope that you as young scouts will speak out against this as you get older and when you go to college and even above of that age. Kentucky came up with its first road win of the season last night, much to the dismay of Auburn fans. The Cats won it by three points in overtime, 86-83. to Both teams had two and five SEC records going into the game, but you couldn't tell by the way the game was played. Auburn's Bobby Kadich had one of his best games, getting 23 points against the Kentucky zone. And Ford, Rich Valavicious, hit 9 of 10 field goal attempts and finished with 20 points. It was a seesaw game. In the first half, Auburn led by as many as 9 points, but Kentucky held a 7-point lead at one point in the second half. The score was tied 72-72 at the end of regulation play. In the overtime period, Auburn appeared to have the game wrapped up with possession of the ball and a one-point lead with only 15 seconds left. But the ball got loose, and Kentucky's Jay Scheidler then became the hero for the Cats. Scheidler made uh, a super play in scooping up that loose ball. It was a fumble between Hart and Valvicious at, right at the midcourt line. Had they retrieved it, it had been an over and back, but we would have had to work for the basket. And that way, uh, the way it turned out, Jay scooped it up and went in for the layup, which was a winning margin. Kentucky has fallen on hard times this year. The Cats are off to their worst start in 10 years. And last week, their starting center, Chuck Alexinas, quit the team. Coach Hall, however, says his team's morale is still good. These players are a great bunch of guys. They're hard workers. They, get, they play with a lot of determination. 
and uh, they have a lot of the winning attitude in them. They just haven't found out how to win, and games like this certainly help. For a while, Kentucky was in the cellar in the league, and that's a very strange position for Kentucky. Did you feel any pressure considering that? Yes, uh, yes and no, and, and uh, there's pressure in all phases of basketball, no matter if you're in the middle, the basement, or on top. Uh, wherever you find yourself, you, you may have a different type pressure, but you have pressure. And uh, I, it, it's our turn to be in the cellar. We, we lost a lot of good players. We had some years that we were unable to recruit, and uh, we're, we're wide open for recruiting right now. James Spann, WSFA-TV Sports. The 1970 national census says that Alabama has at least 538,382 people who are aged 16 to 24. And there's a Lawrence Berkeley laboratory survey that predicted that by 1979, in that same age bracket, there would be 637,291 people within the state boundaries. The Alabama Department of Industrial Relations Research and Statistics Division shows in their latest figures that out of that overall number, there were 141,000 kids actively seeking a job, which placed them in the state's job market. Of that number, only 109,000 were employed, with the remaining 32,000 out of work. That leaves an unemployment figure in the youth bracket of 22.7 percent. That compares with a statewide overall unemployment rate of 7.4 percent. Jack Dennis, the director of the Montgomery County State Employment Office in this county, says this high youth unemployment figure has reason, the first being that this youth market is broken into segments. Well, first we have the group of teenagers who are still in school and seeking part-time work. Then we have the teenager, or the youth that we'll call it, that are out of school. Some have completed school and some are dropouts. And then we have the college level uh, group and they are available and uh, all three groups uh, are looked at differently by employers when they're seeking work. Also each group has a different set of restrictions including a high turnover rate. I would say there's quite a bit of movement however uh, we have to gen treat it in a general way and say that it's dependent upon the teenager, dependent upon the company that they go with, and as to whether or not they have completed school and are still in training. Sometimes, uh, with, say with the technical school, and even those that are, are in some of the, uh, what we call the business colleges, they may start part-time near the end of their training into a field in which they're being trained for and go right on and stay with the company. However, uh, in the fast foods, uh, uh, most people who get into the fast food industries, uh, as you well know, to go further, they have to take transfers possibly to other cities. So Dennis says these kids are employed in a multitude of fields, but primarily in two, one being sales, such as department store clerks, cashiers, salespersons, stock persons, and on down the line. The second area of high teen employment is the fast food field. Many also go to work with large manufacturing firms, factories, plants, and agencies. How do they do there? Well, Dennis says they do well. Basically, uh, most employers are happy with the teenagers. We, uh, and here again, I use the word teenager, we keep using that, and I'd say youth, because we classify 21 and under as youth, and we've got, as we mentioned a moment ago some outstanding cases where young people started while they were still in high school, worked with the same employer, and are still employed with the same employer. In fact, I can go back and show you some people in very responsible positions in my years since 1961 here that started off as a teenager with a firm, and they are now holding very responsible positions with the companies. Most employers are happy with the teenagers. Tomorrow night, we'll take a look at the restrictions the state puts on the employment of youths the violations on the part of the employer in hiring two young people, and necessary steps in protecting teens and other youths from jobs that they shouldn't be at. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA TV News. In our last report on teens working, we looked at the number of kids who were working, where they worked, and perhaps why they worked. Well, tonight, where kids should not have been employed, why they shouldn't work just anywhere, and how to keep them from violating child labor laws. 
and also how to keep the employer from violating those same laws. The director of the Child Labor Law Enforcement Division of the Department of Industrial Relations is James Cogdell. Cogdell says their job is not finding kids' jobs, but making sure that kids are hired in the right places. Well, the Child Labor Agency is a law enforcement agency to set up to protect uh, minors in employment. As for their safety, their, the law provides for their safety and prohibits them, for example, if they're under 16 working in manufacturing plants or working with certain tools or implements. Um, further, the law provides, once again, for people under 16 years of age uh, that they can only work a certain number of hours, um, cannot work past 8 o'clock at night. Um, another protection in the law deals with alcoholic beverages, not <clears throat> not the drinking of beverages, but where teenagers are employed. Mm -hmm. um, there's a prohibition for teenagers to work in places um, where alcoholic beverages are served for consumption on the premises mm -hmm. if they're under 18 years of age. And then there are some exceptions to that. They well, your manual is probably pretty thick on this, isn't it, as far as yes. the exceptions, the rules. Mm -hmm. yes. So the safe thing for any employer to do would be to, to check. That's right. In aiding youths from becoming employed in the wrong place, up until a certain age, they must fill out a work permit to be completed by the employer, the applicant, and the school attended by the youth. The permit issuing officers have the discretion of turning down a permit request based on probable violations of the child labor laws, of which there are many, with just as many exceptions and conditions. Cogdell says the largest area of violation on the employer's part is the lack of securing youth employment certificates, the work permit. Cogdell says this simple violation can always lead to other violations, such as placing too young an employee in the operation of complicated pieces of machinery or working hours too demanding of a youth. At the same time, Cogdell says the violations have been extremely serious. We have had uh, a young man fall off of a scaffold within this last year and received uh, some real bad injuries, but he was not killed, although he fell uh, I think uh, 18 or 20 feet. Uh, he was too young to be in that kind of work and on that scaffold. Cogdell says another violation dealt with a very young girl in a strip joint. There was a prosecution that took place involving the youngest uh, strip uh, striptease dancer was uh, uh, several years now that this one occurred. This particular young one was 13 years of age dancing in a nightclub. Who's to blame for this? Cogdell has several areas he'd like to point a finger at. Obviously, there's some lack of uh, attention to the children's needs on the part of some parents. We could say that, but, but the employer has this responsibility to hire properly. At the same time, Cogdell says he's having a hard time combating the problem through convictions. Penalties range from as low as $10 to a max of only $500 and 90 days in jail. Cogdell says that's just not enough. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA TV News. Think it needs to be At least 60 people have been recommended for federal judgeships in Alabama. These lawyers are among those named on the list. President Carter will appoint the new judges after final recommendations are made by the Special Judicial Commission in Washington and by Alabama Senators Donald Stewart and Howell Heflin. Among the positions to be filled with Alabamians are three new judgeships in the U.S. District Court of Northern Alabama, one new judgeship in the Middle District Federal Court, and one seat on the expanded U.S. Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. One Alabamian seeking a place on the Federal Appellate Court is Alabama Supreme Court Justice Janie Shores. She is the only woman ever to sit on the state Supreme Court, and at the time of her election, Justice Shores was the third woman in the nation to sit on any state's highest court. She says she feels good about her chances for a federal judgeship. I'm optimistic. I, I think the president has made a very firm commitment that he will consider women for these positions and minorities. And that's the first for us. The president or the Justice Department or both have set out criteria to be considered in making the nominations to the president. And there are some five categories. Uh, they're looking for people with experience, of course, at the appellate level, 
trial level. They're cautioned to consider teaching experience, legal writing. In other words, what they're urging upon them is a consideration of things other than what has been predominantly the main consideration in the past, and that is an experienced trial practice. I admit very readily that the, uh, the turn my career has taken is I'm weak in terms of having spent a number of years in the trial practice. I just didn't do that. But I've spent nearly 20 years studying the law. And I'm, I'm proficient in four of the five areas, he suggests. Justice Shores has the support of high-ranking judges and prominent politicians, but the final decision will be up to President Carter. Elaine Stewart, WSFA-TV News. Committing to the commission, Mr. Cooper's name is Number one, as a businessman, he has an outstanding, successful record. Number two, as a soldier, a Marine, I hope you'll excuse me for that. Excuse me. As a Marine, <coughs> Colonel Cooper has an outstanding record. And as a member of the Alabama legislature, he is one of the most respected members of that body and has been chosen by the speaker to be chairman of the Commission of Insurance. And those are three good reasons. But the most important reason is because Mr. Cooper is a good man a dedicated man, dedicated to service for the people of Alabama, and as a gentleman. During the long campaign, Governor Fobb James said again and again that he wanted the state of Alabama to have a new constitution. Today, he presented members of the Joint Legislative Interim Committee a copy of his proposed constitution. The massive document, which took a special committee three months to write, contained several major articles, such as home rule, provisions for initiative and recall elections, guidelines for taxation and debts, annual meetings of the legislature, duties of the executive department, and a declaration of rights. In presenting the proposed constitution, James thanked several people who worked on it. Uh, they worked hard, countless hours, uh, for two or three months now, and I think they've got a draft here that will reflect the quality of that thinking. I might say that uh, this was done out of their desire to be of service to the state of Alabama without any cost whatsoever to my office or to the state. According to a summary of the proposed constitution, home rule would be extended to counties as well as cities. Under the present constitution, cities can obtain home rule through a charter, and the new constitution would provide the same for counties. The draft of the Constitution also contains provisions for initiative and recall elections. In these processes, a certain number of signatures could be obtained to either change a law or remove a public official from office through another election. In the area of taxation and debt limitation, the new Constitution has a provision that requires the state to have a balanced budget. The document also sets up annual sessions of the legislature, but limits the even-year sessions to 15 days for budget purposes only and the off-years to 30 days. It also sets up a legislative compensation commission. In the executive side of government, the draft would allow the governor to reorganize the executive department by order with approval by the legislature. The proposed draft maintains the current Constitution's Declaration of Rights as they relate to jury trials but it does allow the legislature to modify or alter civil actions. The members of the Joint Committee will continue their work analyzing the proposed Constitution for the next several weeks. Dennis Latham, WSFA TV News at the Capitol. University of Alabama President David Matthews and Mental Health Commissioner Taylor Hardin have signed an agreement that would begin a study into the possibility of the two bodies trading some land. The land swap would allow the university to take over land presently occupied by the Bryce Mental Health Hospital facilities. In turn, the university would donate land to the mental health department, allowing them to begin with a new hospital. 
Both officials were happy with their move. As we look to our long-term future and as they look to theirs, it just seems incumbent upon us to discuss whether uh, those lands that uh, are contiguous to the campus uh, really over the, in, in, the, in the long view uh, ought to best in the interest of the state to become part of the university campus uh, in exchange for lands uh, that the university has elsewhere that are not as important to it as, as contiguous uh, acreage. The Bryce Hospital has been in existence since 1853 and has long since uh, served its usefulness and outgrown its usefulness really as a viable functional mental health institution. So to me, it is extremely logical and in the best interest of the University of Alabama and the State Department of Mental Health to work very uh, strongly in this planning effort toward the mutual goals here of relocation of Bryce Hospital and the incorporation of the pre present Bryce campus into the main campus of the University of Alabama. Hardin says renovation of the present Bryce facilities would be impractical. The hospital will relocate in the Tuscaloosa area. As to the question of where, it hasn't been answered yet. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA-TV News.